Hello everyone. I guess this is going to be a mystery whether I'm a software player or a software engineer. So today we're going to discuss the future of the front-end frameworks. This talk is going to be primarily based on my experience on working on Angular as well as talking to developers and some practices that we have been following inside of Google, not necessarily with Angular, but we have been consistently following them for some of our biggest projects, such as Google Photos, Google Drive, and many others. So the agenda for today, we're going to focus on one particular area. We're not going to discuss all the potential ways that the frameworks can evolve in the future. We're going to discuss primarily how we can optimize the loading experience for the next billion users. These are usually users with lower network connection and not that powerful mobile devices. So we are not going to make them a good favor by providing them with 10 megabytes of JavaScript bundle that their device is going to uh, pretty much choke with. So we're going to discuss rehydration, serving, and data. How many of you are familiar with the concept of rehydration into the context of like front-end frameworks? Okay. And how many of you are familiar with the process, uh, with the concept of progressive rehydration? Okay, so hopefully you're going to get some value out of this. This is going to set some constraints on the way we are loading our applications, and by using data, we're going to enhance them and make them better and more personalized for our users. As you might have noticed, I have this like Angular logo at the top, and I'm working on Angular. But this presentation is not going to represent the Angular roadmap. It is completely based on my personal opinion. And in the same time, since I know that there are people using different technologies here, I'm not saying that the framework of the future is Angular or React or like any of these. It could be, because I know that we are all looking into the future. We are all trying to align with the fast changing business requirements. We're also working on evolving the web standards. So it's very likely that any of these frameworks is going to adopt the practices that I'm going to discuss today. But I'm not even saying that the language of the future is JavaScript, although the chances that are that it's going to be JavaScript. This language is very dynamic, and progressive rehydration sets some constraints on our application, specifically how we should load them. So JavaScript might not be the most appropriate language out there. Before we get started, I want to start with this tweet here. So according to my observations recently, what's what makes technology successful is to make our users happy and to make developers happy. That's, that's pretty much everything that we should optimize a technology for. Very often, having a more performant or cost-efficient or even safe technology is not that essential in the process. There are many examples over the years. If our technology is good enough to satisfy the business requirement, we're completely focused on development experience so that we can productively ship features and be happy with that. With this in mind, we can keep going. We can start with rehydration. So how are we serving a web application in 2019? We're going to discuss particularly single-page application with server-side rendering enabled. In this case, we have three different actors. We have our browser, a Node.js server, and an API server. First, the browser is going to send a request to Node.js. This Node.js server, it could be wrapped in another technology as well. It doesn't matter. It is going to run our front-end application. It is pretty much going to go through all the lifecycle hooks of the framework, invoke a bunch of uh, custom logic, and eventually we're going to send requests to our API server to fetch some data, some state. We're going to pass the state together with the server-side rendered content, which is just HTML, to the browser. If we want to implement state transfer, we're going to serialize the state and eventually serialize the JSON and place it directly into the HTML so that we can rehydrate or deserialize the state and take advantage of it without doing any redundant requests. Now, the next interesting part that happens is inside of the browser, because the browser has to somehow turn this HTML into a deserialized DOM tree. So it is going to build the DOM tree based on the HTML that we passed from our Node.js server. Once the browser does that, we need to go through a process of rehydration, where I'm not me meaning like uh, drinking water in this moment. I'm particularly meaning the framework taking over and enhancing the DOM with some custom event listeners and uh, pretty much building the component tree. So we're going to send a request to a CDN in order to get a bunch of JavaScript, which is 
our application framework together with our app. Our application framework is going to start traversing this tree and enhancing it by adding state, event listeners, and building the component tree. So there are two different alternatives here. We can either go through this process of rehydration, or the framework can destroy the entire DOM tree and rebuild it from scratch. In all cases, there are some computationally intensive things happening. And if our app.js is a large file, we may consume a lot of time in downloading this file, decompressing it, after that going through lexical analysis, syntax analysis, like executing this code and traversing the DOM tree. So this is quite a computationally intensive thing. And in fact, our user is going to be in this uncanny valley where they're going to see the UI, but they will not be able to interact with it at all. And this could be from a couple of milliseconds to a couple of seconds, depending on their network connection speed, their device, and how big our application bundle is. Obviously, there are a lot of pros of this approach of using single-page apps with, single, with server-side rendering. We are optimized for SEO, and of course, we have very good social media support. Also, once the application is loaded, the user is going to get an immediate experience. We have loaded so many scripts, and we have all the functionality required for our application, so the transitions are going to be smooth. The user's uh, interactions are going to be pretty smooth as well, because we're directly going to handle them with the scripts that are already in our memory. And the resource, resources, if we do our job well, they're going to be downloaded and processed only once. However, there are a lot of cons. I bet most of you have had to deal with state management, and that's not fun. Like, whether you're using NGRX or Redux, or you're using more object-oriented approach with some like services which are preserving your state, it's a complicated thing to manage this mutable state and propagate it across your applications once it changes. So single-page apps are pretty hard to build. We're also not optimized for server-side rendering because we have built technologies that are optimized for building user interface, and somehow they ended up being run on the server. They would, unfortunately, never be as, effe as efficient as technologies which were primarily optimized for running on the server, because we have a bunch of lifecycle hooks which are meant to be executed on the client, and that's what they, what, where they have their meaning. As well, you saw this process of rehydration, our user interface is completely unresponsive at this point. We just have a bunch of structure, but not behavior attached to it. Back in the days, in 2008, life was much simpler. Back then, there were a couple of events which were very interesting, like uh, essential for me, that happened. First, Steve Jobs announced the best iPhone ever created, iPhone 3G back then. This happened somewhere in San Francisco, and I was much closer to here a couple of thousands of kilometers away, I was back in Bulgaria presenting my web application on a competition in web technologies in front of an audience which consisted of this single person. <laughs> so I presented my app there. I built a CMS system. On top of it, I developed a website for a mountain that I live close by. So I had a bunch of Ajax. That was kind of a very like, exciting thing for me to not have to reload my page on each interaction of the user with it. So I had hidden iframes and XMHP requests, like active vex and like everything crazy that you can imagine. And it was all right, but there is still something which is driving me crazy about this app. When I look at it right now, like, do you remember we didn't have border radius, so we had to do these hacks with to, to, to introduce this. Like, Anyway, I will forget about this for a second. Um, I built it with the LAMP stack, which is Linux, Apache, with MySQL, and PHP. Like, I have written PHP, and this language grew much more over the years, so it's not what it, is, what it used to be. But uh, this language, uh, like implementing a web app back then, was pretty much uh, like we had our browser sending requests to the Apache server, which was running, executing our scripts. They were fetching data from the database. After that, we were getting server-side rendered content because, well, that's what we were used to. And right after that, if we wanted eventually to do something like some incremental page reloads or like load some state incrementally, we, had, we were able to send an XML HTTP request over the network, get, this, uh, get some data from our PHP scripts, and that was it. If we wanted to do any state transfer, that was pretty easy as well. 
We just had to serialize as JSON some of the state that we got from our database and make it available inside of a script tag. That was our fancy state transfer. So server-side rendering and state transfer almost for free. Obviously, there are a lot of pros of this approach. We have server-side rendering by default without having to configure a bunch of servers and like spending a lot of money on containers. The application was interactive immediately. We had page reloads on interaction, so that was not perfect, but still the user was able to use the application once they see it rendered into the screen. We had rehydration kind of thing without destroying the DOM because, well, the user was uh, loading the application with a bunch of scripts. They were adding event listeners to the DOM elements, and our applications were interactive from this moment on. We were able to rehydrate the application somehow. And rehydration, again, this is the process of the framework traversing the structure of our application and enhancing it, just building a component tree out of the DOM elements that we already have. We were also not um, we were also getting only the assets associated with the current page if we were doing our job well. We had a bunch of scripts that were referenced inside of the individual pages, and they were associated pretty much with the current page. We didn't have to load any redundant scripts that we needed to parse. But why uh, we went away from this approach? We didn't provide immediate transitions across pages. We had to reload the entire page every single time. And very often, we have to download and process the same assets multiple times. We had the same scripts referenced in different pages, so the browser had to download them or get them from the cache multiple times, parse them, and execute them, which felt, felt a, bit, a bit redundant. But still, why did we go to all this complexity of single-page apps only for like, this tiny requirement, not requiring page reloads? So we asked the business, and the business wanted the power of desktop applications combined with the convenience of web apps. So well, we started building single-page apps. Now, let us look into the future and see how we can take best from both worlds so that we can optimize our application for fast page reloads and interaction. The rule number one here is to optimize for our users' happiness. So we should optimize for very fast application reloads, loads, initial loads, and after that, go away from the cons of the multi-page applications where we had to do a constant page reload. So we, we need to preserve this from single-page apps, but somehow speed up the initial page load by loading only the minimum amount of scripts required. We can do that with progressive rehydration. Let us look at how progressive rehydration works. So we have single-page app with server-side rendering enabled, again. We're going to send requests to the Node.js server, it's going to fetch data from our API server, and we're going to return the server-side rendered content to the browser. But we are not going to load any scripts at this point. We're just going to get the HTML, the browser is going to build the DOM tree and visualize something into the browser. That's it for this at this point. Right now, we're going to try to do this progressive rehydration and see how it works. We're going to show this in the like, fancy UI of the future where I put all my design skills together to render this page. So here we have a chat widget, uh, not chat widget, but a weather widget, which shows the weather forecast. We have a user profile details form, this red thing into the middle. We have a user avatar and user details. We can turn this eventually into a component tree which looks like this. We have our app component, weather form, profile, icon, and so on and so forth. Now, still, this component tree does not exist because we have returned a bunch of HTML to the browser and we just have the DOM tree. Let's track and see how a user interaction with this application is going to look like. We have our app, and let's say that the user wants to edit their name. They're going to update the form and click onto a button. At this point, we need to react to this interaction somehow. And since we don't have any JavaScript, we need to load it we are going to detect that the event happened inside of the form control. So we are going to download the form component over the network and execute the associated logic with the click handler. Right after that, we're going to send a request over the network. We're going to save the username. 
we're going to get a response from the server and pass the new information down the component tree. From this moment on, we need to rehydrate all the different components that are going to handle this change. So we're going to rehydrate the app component, the profile component, and the details component. We're going to download each one of these components over the network, and we're going to execute the rendering logic associated with them so that they can detect the changes which we introduce in the app. Here, we have downloaded only the minimum amount of components that are required or necessary for handling this user interaction. So we didn't have to ship a huge bundle, which is like 10 megabytes or a megabyte or so, and make our application unresponsive for a couple of seconds. Still, this approach has its own drawbacks. We're going to discuss them in a second. But this is a good start. So the rules of progressive rehydration are a component is loaded and bootstrapped or interaction, or when it receives new data through you can call them inputs or props, or however you prefer to call them into the context of your favorite framework. Also, each logical unit has its own bundle. This, so this means that we don't have to perform bundling as part of our build process in this case. We can either keep the files the way that we developed them, or run something which is going to find the common chunks among them and make the syntactic chunks even on a like, better level of granularity. Let's track the download time and see how we can improve it. So on a click of the button, we'll have to download a lot of files. We'll, we'll first have to download the form, but we cannot handle the user interaction until we have loaded the business logic associated with this form, which is, let's say, the user service or user sync action. So we'll have to send another request to the network to get the user service. Once we do that, we can execute the click handler in the form. Right after that, once we get a response from the back end, we can load uh, the app component, the profile component, the details component, which may use a formatter for the username, so we would have to download it as well. And finally, we'll be able to visualize the change. So we kind of made the situation even worse, right? We have a series of waterfall downloads in this case. If you look at uh, Chrome DevTools, we're going to see something like this. We're loading the individual scripts one after another, since once we load a script, we're figuring out its dependencies, and we're loading them as well. When we see something like this in Chrome DevTools, then we are doing something wrong, probably. So that's why we're going to look at another pillar here. We're going to discuss serving, how we can serve efficiently applications with progressive rehydration enabled. One option is to just take all the different components put them into a single route bundle, and that's it. Once the user starts interacting with the application, if this bundle is small enough, we'll be able to download it and bootstrap the app. This is a single HTTP request. We'll be able to get the script from the closest geolocation to the user among uh, all the different edges from our CDN network, and eventually things may work out. But some pages have pretty big routes. For example, Google Analytics here has um, like a carousel widget for kittens. It has a uh, calculator. It has NFL scores. It has weather forecasts. It has a stopwatch. It has movies. So the route level code splitting does not scale too well. At some point, our bundle is going to get several megabytes, and we'll have to figure out how to improve things. What we can do instead is, together with the server-side rendered content from our Node.js server, push also the dependency graph among our modules. Once the users start interacting with our application, we can traverse this dependency graph and figure out which is the minimum subset of modules that is required for handling the user interaction. Right after that, we can send a request to our server, or our like CDN-like thing, which contains all the different scripts that we have to download, and the server can push them either concatenating them together or using HTTP2 eventually. This is an approach that is actually widely used. We have been using it in Google for the past like six years, maybe. I have seen this pattern in many other framework, in many other companies as well. And, um, but how does this work with static CDN server? Well, it doesn't work at all. We have to use something which provides us an API to configure onto the edge directly. 
it's good that some hosting providers, they're already introducing some logic onto the edge. For example, Cloudflare, they introduced service worker-like API, which is going to allow you to run some custom logic directly on the CDN edge. All right, so we discussed how we can implement rehydration. We discussed serving and progressive rehydration, how we can combine these technologies together. I believe that from the loading experience of our users, the next thing that is going to happen is data. How we can use data in order to provide more personalized user experiences, how we can optimize per individual user instead of providing a generic solution which somehow works for everyone. This means that how we're going to load our application should be a function on the features of the application and features of our users. By features here, I don't mean functionality. I mean different characteristics of our features and users. For example, based on the archetype of our app and based on the structure and how many files we have, we can decide whether we need to perform server-side rendering, pre-rendering, or client-side rendering. And this, this could be a data-driven solution. This could be an automated data-driven decision, not like based on our own personal feelings, because our own personal feelings sometimes are wrong. We can, we can judge on how to prefetch data and files depending on where our users go in their application, for example. We don't have to predict where our users may potentially go because that's usually wrong. This way we can build adaptable and more intelligent systems. So we have a lot of techniques already in machine learning and data analytics that allow us to do that. We have been building very like complex business systems with convolutional neural networks. We have been using recurrent neural networks for natural language processing. And all of these techniques, they can be utilized in the development process. So they have very serious use cases. I want to share <laughs> one of them with you. So a conference I was attending on, like, uh, about a year ago in Atlanta. I was inspired by this fascinating convoluted neural networks used, convolutional neural networks used in uh, self-driving cars. And I want to do something very meaningful. <laughs> So I spent like hours in my room in the hotel <laughs> doing this thing here. I was training my Mortal Kombat character to play Mortal Kombat for me. So that's my like complicated use case and solving business requirements with convolutional neural networks. Anyway, we have this behavior in different systems. Like we have recommender systems, for example, which are already implementing similar business adaptable systems by using recurrent neural networks or like different techniques. For example, YouTube is using this in order to recommend us the best possible content for us. But this technique is not yet widely used in the front-end tool chain. I'm saying yet because we recently released with the Google Chrome team a predictive prefetching framework for web applications. You can use it with your Angular or Gatsby application, Next, or uh, even Nuxt, if you're using Vue, you can fetch data from your data analytics source, for example, from Google Analytics or your favorite analytics provider. Based on this data and some metadata for your application, like its routing structure, we can build a machine learning model. And from there, we can enhance your application by providing predictive prefetching experience. So here, depending on your user's navigational patterns, we can fetch this date, we can prefetch ahead of time things that are likely to be needed next. This technique is already used by the Angular application of Microsoft Office 365. So they, they have component level code splitting to speed up the future user, user interactions with the application, depending on how their users are consuming the app, they're prefetching different components. But of course, you don't have to be Microsoft or Google to use this technique. We released it in a Webpack plugin called GuessJS, so you can use it today. Here is how it works. We have a Wikipedia-like application here. After we introduce the Guest plugin to this app, we're going to fetch a report from Google Analytics in this particular case, but you can also hook your uh, custom analytics provider. We're also going to rank the individual links at this page. So depending on the probability for a link to be followed, we can uh, categorize it in one of the three different categories here. For example, very likely to be followed, mildly likely, or unlikely. 
we can see that developer and programmer are very likely to be followed. This technique is used by Navid, for example, in his popular website for finding jobs in Pakistan. He has tens of thousands of users a day. So it was a good fit to see what improvement it is going to bring to his app. He's building this application here. Since I'm working on the Angular team, and I'm primarily looking for uh, people here who are using Angular, this app is built with uh, Angular, but we're also in a close collaboration with Gatsby, so they have predictive prefetching experience there as well. So here is what improvements uh, the predictive prefetching approach brought to his app. Originally, to speed up the user navigation experience in his application, he used a prefetching strategy where we, uh, he was downloading all the modules in his app. So the user visits his application, and he prefetches all the different modules, which cons was consuming 2.56 megabytes of JavaScript, of data, over a wire. For hundreds, uh, for tens of thousands of users a day, this is a lot of like, gigabytes of unnecessary traffic. We went to a, more, like, a, to a better heuristic, where we were prefetching only the links that are in the viewport. If we have, if we have followed uh, the latest, like, web performance things. This is the so-called quick link prefetching strategy. This reduced network cons consumption a lot. But with predictive prefetching, prefetching, we were able to get only 7% of the original network consumption, which is 0.18 megabytes of data, which was significant improvement. Of course, predictive prefetching it is a probabilistic model, so it does not have a 100% accuracy. We achieved about 90% accuracy for users on a fast 3G network. For the remaining 10%, we can implement a different, more suitable, and uh, more conservative prefetching strategy. For example, prefetching on mouse over, which is going to improve their navigation experience as well. All right, so I want to go back to the tweet from the beginning. In this presentation, we discussed how to make our users happy by providing them faster user interfaces. And that's our goal in general as developers, to satisfy the business requirements, not to build like Mortal Kombat characters that are fighting for us. Like We are aiming to improve our users' experience, and that's what we should focus on. In the Angular team, we're focused on making developers happy. So I'm constantly talking to different engineers so that we can move the web standards in the right direction, so that we can improve your development experience. We're trying to build better tools for you faster tools which are making you happy. So I would really love to chat together so that we can build the future of the front end frameworks together. That was it. Thank you. And that leaves us quite a bit of time for questions and answers, ladies and gentlemen. Do you have any questions for our speaker, for Minko? You would have noticed the special superhero eco effect at the beginning we have added. That's a joke, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions for Minko? None? It was all super clear? That speaks highly of the quality of the presentation itself, but I'm sure you have some questions. Or it's too early in the morning or you just want to... Or it was super unclear. <laughs> or it was super unclear. Use the microphone, everyone will hear you. Hi, uh, can you elaborate a bit about the uh, guess? Yeah. Guess, uh, framework? Yeah, uh, guess guess is a webpack plugin which, depending on your route level code splitting structure, basically it finds all the lazy routes in your application. It maps them to uh, different URLs from extracted from Google Analytics, and it computes the probability for the user to need a particular chunk. So it is going to, it can do one of two things. It can either create a very simple like mark of chain, like like a probabilistic like probability matrix, and bundle it together with your application, so that every time when the user performs a navigation, we're querying this matrix and seeing what is the prob which are the next probable chunks, like JavaScript chunks that the user may need next, and we're going going to download them. Still, this depends on the user connection. If the user is in a data saving mode, we're not going to download anything. Or another alternative, because shipping the entire matrix could be big, uh, like could be a lot of uh, like kilobytes of data if you have a large application. Another alternative that we're doing is like um, ahead of time, we are looking at the individual JavaScript bundles and 
see and, and at build time we're predicting which are the next bundles that the user may need next. So we're introducing small prefetching instructions in each bundle so that we can prefetch whatever might be required next. So that's these are the two strategies that GetJS uses. Minka, I have a question from a public speaker experience category. Um, is it in any way distracting when you have a, an attractive woman running around you, super close with a camera taking photos while you're trying to answer a question? Is it distracting in any way or not at all? Is the lights? I'm blinded by the lights. Oh, you're yeah. blinded by the lights. <laughs> That's a diplomatic answer. Next question, please. We're all blinded by something, aren't we? Thanks. Uh, great talk. Uh, thanks. Uh, I want to ask about this GasJS because you said that Webpack plugin. Yeah. But uh, it means that there should be some server somewhere where our model is stored. Do you have, I don't know, a Docker image or something like this, or maybe SaaS product uh, which integrated already with Gas? Thanks. Yeah, you don't need to query the model at runtime, so you don't have to make the predictions. You're not sending requests to any server. The model is part of your JavaScript bundle, pretty much. And it may sound like a lot, because we have been talking to TensorFlow.js how to optimize this even further. And of course, shipping TensorFlow.js as part of your app, we're kind of going to kill your web performance completely. Because, not because TensorFlow are doing a bad job, but because like shipping one megabyte of JavaScript so that we can optimize your 10 kilobytes of JavaScript application is kind of unnecessary. Uh, the prefetch we're introducing prefetching instructions as part of your bundle, so you don't have to send the request over the network at all uh, for predict predictions. There are some services which are implementing this approach that you mentioned. We have had discussions on how we can use them for even more like granular prefetching. Um, but so far, we don't really need that. So it's just a Webpack plugin. You specify your Google Analytics view ID, and it should do everything for you eventually. If it doesn't, you can open an issue. Ladies and gents, more questions for Minko. Uh, thanks, Minko. Um, I have a question about uh, progressive uh, rehydration um, in the context of Angular. Um, can you like tell us or show us a like, bit of nitty-gritty of uh, how this could be implemented? Yeah, I would recommend to look at Google I.O. 2019. Uh, they are my uh, colleagues, Steven and Vikram, they show a demo with progressive rehydration. There are, I looked at, when I typed progressive rehydration in Google the other day, I saw that there is a demo with React as well, so you can look at it as, as well. So there are different frameworks that are, are looking at this direction. I have talked to Tom Dale from Ember as well, and they are looking at in from a slightly different angle, so it's it's kind of a, a technique that we are excited about in general. I don't know if it's going to happen and it's going to be widely available because it sets some constraints on top of the application, so we will not be able to build applications the way that we're building them today. But it may eventually happen. That's, that's a prediction. Thank you. Any further questions? I need to go to that side of the room because the lights are indeed blinding. Who has another question? Faminka. Oh, back to that. And there was one there in the front. Two more questions. Uh, regarding the predictive prefetching more on browser side, uh, like when you build up this quite big and like you split into two teams and you have two different apps, like uh, regarding predictive prefetching, like from one app to another app, often across subdomains, is it currently supported by any browser, like predictive prefetching of entire la apps? You, uh, you mean, uh, yeah, you mean cross-origin prefetching? Yeah. Uh, or within same domain, but yeah. But against different apps, because one app is built on one team, second app is other, but they within the same. Yeah, I guess there are a couple of things you can do. Like first, DNS prefetching would make sense. You should, you should be able to use maybe not predictive prefetching since there are two, two apps. So like you don't have to make a lot of predictions. The user can go to one application, pretty much, from your current app. Uh, you can prefetch the page that is most likely to be needed next with uh, link prefetch. This should work. Y I guess you don't need predictive prefetching then. It, you can just apply like sim simpler version without having to introduce yet another tool. Next question, please. Yeah. Thank 
you. Uh, thank you for your talk. Very, very inspiring. And it kind of, if I may, this will be a bit of a broad question, not about technical kind of, of uh, aspects of implementation, but um, have you been at yesterday's talk by Kita? Uh, by any chance. I had to skip it. I had another meeting, unfortunately. Okay, okay, no worries. Uh, but, um, so what I was asking myself kind of in this context is I'm kind of a little bit fascinated that during our conference, those two days, the topic of optimizing pr loading in general is like really common. I think there were like five talks around uh, about this topic. And when we are talking about happy users, um, what we assumed here, these are users with, as you said, like mobile devices, which are not that performant. Yeah. And I'm curious, for instance, if this is actually narrowing our our kind of yeah. field. So because uh, when I was listening, when I was listening to your talk, I was like, okay, this yeah. is so cool. I can actually use convolutional neural networks uh, for my front yeah. end work. Yeah, and and Akita said something like that yesterday. That you know, when you're standing by the water cooler uh, and there is a back end dev talking about all the cool stuff they are doing on the front, and you're like, I want to do that too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so when I'm hearing about this, it's like I want to do this, but do we really need to? Yeah, that's a good point. <laughs> So yeah, we had an Angular survey recently, and uh, we thought that performance is essential for everyone. And it turned out that pretty much everyone we asked was satisfied with the performance like uh, that their uh, their users are getting. So I don't think it's necessary for everyone. Yeah, you can optimize, you, especially if you're building an internal application and you're accessing it through a local network. Like whether your bundle is going to be like two megabytes or like 15 megabytes, you will like probably your users are going to be fine with that. So um, these are some practices that we may enable from framework perspective for everyone, and we're, we may try to make this transparently if possible. But this is not our primary goal. That's why I started with a disclaimer that this is not this no, does not necessarily reflect our uh, roadmap in the Angular team, because we find that this is important. But in the same time, we might be able to do something which is more efficient for our users. And like, I would love to chat with you to see what would be important for you. Do we have another question from uh, Happy Coder, as le at least as happy as Magdalena? Another one? I can't see you at all. Minko, do you see anyone in the audience wanting to ask you a question? I don't know. I don't see anything. Yeah. <laughs> anyone, ladies and gentlemen? Or do you want to speak to Minko individually? So it's thank you, Minko, once again. Thank you very much for a great opening presentation of the day.